Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to the summer 2020 offering of EC3084 Signals and Systems. Today we'll be looking at Fourier series. If you are an EC student at Georgia Tech, you should have already seen this material in EC 2026, but it's a fairly complicated topic, so it's good to look at it again. And for our purposes here in 3084, it's also a very natural way to talk about Fourier transforms, which will be the primary subject of some future lectures. Suppose we have a function x of t that is periodic with period t naught, i.e. x of t plus t naught is equal to x of t. It, we can write this as a sum of complex exponentials. The complex exponentials are complex sinusoids with the frequency omega naught times k. This is a sum of k potentially going from minus infinity to infinity. So we have a t here to get our complex sinusoids. The a k's here are called Fourier series coefficients. Sometimes if you have, for instance, a case where x of t is, is already specified as a summer product of sinusoids, you can find the a of k's directly, and we'll see an example of that later. But for right now, suppose that it's something more complicated. To find the a k's, we will need to use the Fourier series analysis integral. We will integrate our function x t times e to the minus j omega naught k t, where omega naught is the fundamental frequency in terms of radians per second. That's given by 2 pi over t naught. And the basic difference between these formulas, besides this being an integral and this being a sum, is the sign in the exponent that's needed to get the math to work out. The t naught in the subscript here indicates that I can integrate over any period and get the same answer for a k. Usually x of t will be specified in a particular way such that it'll be pretty obvious which period you want to use in order to try to get your answer. When I'm computing a k, I'll often start using omega naught for brevity when writing expressions, but at some point once you plug in 2 pi over t naught, you'll see that things will simplify so t naught doesn't appear in the answer. I'm going to compute the Fourier series coefficients for a square wave where the quote-unquote on part of the wave is symmetrically centered around zero. You could, of course, compute Fourier series coefficients for square waves with different time shifts, and we'll see later that that would correspond to a change of phase in the Fourier series coefficients. I think square wave is a little bit of a misnomer. I think it would be more accurate to say this is a rectangular wave with a duty cycle of 50%, meaning it's on half the time. Because if you think about it, a square is a rectangle where the two sides are the same length, but that only makes sense if your two dimensions have the same measurement units. So here the horizontal axis is in time and the vertical axis is in volts or current or sound pressure or light intensity or whatever it is. However, people do call 50% duty cycle rectangular wave square wave, so we'll call it a square wave too. So the middle of the off part of the waves here will be at t naught over two and minus t naught over two. And of course this goes on infinitely either direction meaning the on part of the wave in here is going from minus t naught over 4 to t naught over 4. So let's compute the Fourier series coefficients for this case. A of k is equal to 1 over t naught, integral of, and well, I get to pick what to integrate over. I'm going to pick this section here in the middle. So watch this. What function am I integrating? Well, I'm going to integrate this function, I'm just gonna draw it in right here without using any formulas and such. You could try to do this with something where you write in unit step functions and blah, 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 but it wouldn't actually give you something that was any clearer as to what was going on. So what are we going to integrate between? Well, technically speaking, I'm gonna integrate here over the period of minus t naught over two, t naught over two, but it hardly matters because really this is just one, I should have mentioned that in this region, and so it's just going to really chop off the limits of the integral. To finish this off, let me write e to the minus j omega naught kt dt, and now I realize that earlier I forgot the dt up here. Bad me, no cookie for me. All right, so what is this really? I'm going to integrate between minus t naught over 4 to t naught over 4, 
And let me be careful not to forget the one over T naught that's sitting out in front. I often forget that. And if I wanted to be pedantic, I could put the number one here. I don't really have to. What am I integrating? E minus J omega naught K T D T. Okay, so the rest of this is just calculus. Okay, so let's do some calculus. I'll have e to the minus j, and at this point, I'm going to go ahead and substitute 2 pi over t naught in for omega naught kt, and then I'll have in the denominator minus j 2 pi over t naught k. So then if I think about taking the derivative of the exponent here, the constant in front of the t will come down and cancel what I've put in the denominator. And then I need to evaluate this between minus t naught over 4 and t naught over 4. I have a minus j 2 pi over t naught k in the denominator still. And now I plug in t naught over 4 for t up here. Then I subtract what we get from plugging in the lower limit. That'll be e to the minus j 2 pi over t naught k t naught over 4. If I look at what happens here, I'll get some canceling action going on where dividing 2 by 4 will result in a 2 that appears down here. And also notice that the t naught down here cancels with the t naught here. Wait a minute, sorry, when I plugged in minus t naught over 4 here, I forgot that the minus should cancel the minus here. So this should actually be a plus. Let me put that in purple to emphasize that correction. So let me take this minus sign and pull it through here. So I'll get rid of the minus sign of the denominator and just swap the order of the terms. So I'll have e to the j. Oh, look at this. I also have this t naught canceling with this t naught, and this t naught cancels with this t naught. The t naughts have all gone away. That's the thing that you'll see. If they don't go away, that usually indicates a problem. So I'll have e to the j pi k over 2 minus e to the minus j pi k over 2. And all of this is over j 2 pi k. You should look at this and think, hmm, I have e j to the something minus e minus j to the something. And this is all over a thing that has a 2 and a j in it. That should scream out to use Euler's formula. So if we use Euler's formula on this, we can replace it with a sign and write it as sine pi k over 2 divided by pi k. There's one particular integer that's problematic, and that's the case for k equals 0. And for k equals 0, we have sine of 0 equals 0. We have 0 in the denominator, so we have a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. So we have to think about how we'll deal with that particular special case. The formula here only works, obviously, for k that's not 0. So for k equals 0, there's two approaches we can use. One is to use L'Hopital's rule on this expression. So let's define a naught as a limit as k goes to 0 of this expression here. This should automatically make you a little bit nervous. I just told you k is an integer. And here we have something that's presumably a pretty small real number going to 0, which is not a very integer-y thing. Let's just roll with it anyway. Let's take the limit as k goes to 0 and the numerator and the denominator of the derivative of the numerator, which is going to give me cosine pi k over 2 from taking the derivative of the sine. And by the chain rule, a pi over 2 pops out in front. And taking the derivative of the denominator with respect to k just gives me the pi. And both of these pi's cancel. As k goes to 0, this cosine goes to 1, so I'm just left with 1 half. I said that this was one approach to dealing with the special k equals 0 case. Let's try another one. So here's another approach to dealing with this a equals 0 case. Let's take a look at our original Fourier series analysis integral formula. We're integrating over any period of our function times e to the minus j omega naught kt dt. Let's see what happens if we plug into here k equals 0. Well, if we plug in 0 up here, we get e to the 0, which is just 1. So we have a special case of 
A0 being 1 over T0 times the integral of our function over a period. So if you think about it for a second, this is just the average of the signal. So this makes it incredibly easy to figure out what A0 is for the particular case of our square wave. It's on half the time. And here we're saying when it's on, it's equal to 1, and when it's quote-unquote off, it's equal to 0. So in this case, we'll have A0 equal a half, because this thing's on half the time. So these two approaches to figuring out what A, K is in the special case of K equals 0 match up and make sense. In electrical engineering, A0 is often called the DC value, standing for direct current, even in applications where no current or anything related to current is involved. Just roll with it. So let's go back and think about what our expression for the Fourier series coefficients looks like for the non-zero case. Let's think about what the sine function here gives us. So in general, it looks a little something like this, where sine of zero gives us zero, sine of pi gives us zero, and sine of two pi gives us zero. And then it'll have one at pi over two and minus one at three pi over two, or equivalently, minus pi over 2, because remember this keeps going down this direction. It copies itself infinitely either way. So for k that are even and not 0, so maybe I'll write this as plus minus 2, plus minus 4, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I wind up landing on these points where the sign is 0. Remember the k equals 0 point is different. Gave us a half using L'Hopital's rule or our direct integral trick. And then for k odd, we have this alternating 1, minus 1, 1 kind of pattern. So what about k equal 1? I'm leaving some space here because I want to write some things in here later. For k equals 1, I'll have 1 over pi k. And then what about, say, for k equal 3? So I'll write 1 over minus pi k. And then if I look at the pattern here, I'll see that I'll get a 1 out every time we increment or decrement k by 4. So I could write this for 1, 5, 9, or say here minus 3, and dot, 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 either direction. And in this case, down here, I'll have it for 3, 7, 11, dot, 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 or say minus 1 going this direction. Notice a couple of things about this particular set of Fourier series coefficients. The Fourier series coefficients are real valued. In general, AK can be complex valued. In this particular case, we also have symmetry with respect to K because sine is anti-symmetric, i.e. sine of negative smiley face is equal to minus sine of smiley face. So we get a sine flip going from positive to negative K from the sine, but we'll also get a sine flip because we have this K sitting here in the denominator. Again, this is just for this particular case for these particular Fourier series coefficients. In general, you should not expect this particular kind of symmetry. So let's make a plot of the Fourier series coefficients as a function of k. I'll have 1 half for k equals 0. For k equal 1, I'll have 1 over pi. So that's around 1 third. So I could imagine that maybe this is around a third-ish something like that. So this is 1 over pi. And then it's 0 at 2. And then for k equal 3, we'll have negative 1 over pi third. So let's try to make this next one look like it's about a third the height of the a1 coefficient. 4 is even, so that's 0. And then for this one here, I'll have 1 over 5 pi. Oh, let me not forget the 1 over 3 pi that goes down here. And this should have a negative sign. So what about the other ones here? I'll have minus 1 at minus 2 at 0. At minus 3, we'll have minus 1 over 3 pi. It will be 0 at 4. And then at 5, we'll have 1 over 5 pi, because again, it will be back to the positive case here. And then this will keep going either direction. Notice we've used this arrow kind of notation. This is what we used in EC 2026. But I want to caution you that later when we look at Fourier transforms, we'll make similar kind of plots, except those plots are going to have a 1 over 2 pi multiplying everything. And we'll explain where that comes from when we get to that point. Right now I'm making this in this 2026 style notation. 
Another tricky point here is that I'm only able to draw these as arrows going up and down and have that be meaningful because these particular AK happen to be real valued. In general, they're complex valued. So it wouldn't really make sense to say if I had something that was one over pi e to the j pi over three and plot it like this because I would have to somehow maybe have the arrow coming into or out of your computer screen for that to make any sense. So a more common way of drawing plots along these lines is to simply draw all of the arrows going up. So we'll make plots of just the magnitudes of the 4a series coefficients. In this particular case, we could put in the minus signs, but usually what you'll do is you'll write them in a magnitude and a phase notation. Other than maybe for this a0 value, these will be just positive or negative real value numbers, assuming x of t was real to begin with. But otherwise, people will tend to write these in polar form. So we would write this as 1 half, 1 over pi, 1 over pi. Over here, we'll write 1 over 5 pi and 1 over 5 pi. But here, we might write something like 1 over 3 pi times e to the j pi. Technically, you could also put in minus pi, but this is sort of a standard way to do it. Or you might, in this case, put a minus sign here. 1 over 3 pi e to the j pi. This is something you might do where you have other Fourier series coefficients that do have complex value coefficients. So it's not something simple just like a j pi sitting here. So notice the square wave has empty even harmonics. This gives it something of a hollow sound, kind of like a clarinet. Something like a brass sound might be better synthesized using something like a sawtooth wave that would have these missing even harmonics still dropping over the order of 1 minus k. If you wanted to make a flute sound, you might use a triangle wave. This, like the square wave, is missing the even harmonics, but the coefficients drop much faster. They will drop on the order of a 1 over k squared versus the 1 over k kind of drop-offs that you get from either a square wave or a sawtooth wave. So something like the triangle wave will have a strong fundamental. That's that first quote-unquote harmonic. And the partials, which are the harmonics for k bigger than 1, are fairly weak, which will give it a mellow sound. So a triangle wave might be the start of modeling something like a flute. If you are a musician interested in composing for orchestral instruments, there's a company called Spitfire Audio that has a sample library they've created of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. They've released a special Discover package for their BBC Symphony Orchestra samples that is a stripped-down version of the higher price packages. You can get it for $49 right now, or you can get it for free if you fill out a survey and then wait two weeks. I filled it out myself. The survey does not seem to contain anything particularly onerous. And I should also mention I have no pre-existing relationship with Spitfire Audio. They're not offering me any compensation to talk about them or anything like that. For musicians in the audience, I highly recommend the blog of Christian Henson, one of the co-founders of Spitfire Audio, particularly if you're interested in composing for movies, television, or games.